Chapter 10, Section 3, Simplifying Radical Expressions. In this uh, section, we're going to look to use the product rule for radicals. We're also going to use the quotient rule for radicals, both of which I'm going to introduce. We're going to simplify radicals, and of course, we need to learn all the rules to simplify radicals. We're going to simplify products and quotients of radicals using uh, that have different indices. And we're also going to use the Pythagorean theorem, and that means also that we're going to be using the distance formula because the distance formula is derived from the Pythagorean theorem. First things first, I want you to consider the following problem. I have the square root of 25. Let me raise this up. This section's got a little bit to it, so I'll lace them up tight. I have the square root of 25. That's supposed to be a 5 there. Uh, times 4. And over here I have the square root of 25 times the square root of 4. Well, the square root of 25 times 4, 25 times 4 is 100, and of course the square root of 100 is 10. Over here, the square root of 25 is 5, the square root of 4 is 2, 5 times 2 is 10, and we get the same amount. Now, does that mean it works every time? Well, you can't always use that with one example and, and generalize uh, inductively that it works all the time, but we can actually turn out uh, that we can say this with confidence because we have the product rule for radicals. Now, the product rule for radicals says that if you have the nth root of a and the nth root of b, and these are real numbers, these are defined, and n is a natural number, then the square root of, uh, or the nth root of a times the nth root of b is equal to the nth root of a times b, or the product of the two nth roots is the nth root of the product. Now, it only works if they have the same index. Remember, the index is the number that's kind of in the little crook of the radical sign. So these two numbers have to match. If they don't match, then you can't use this property. And here's some examples. Multiply, assume that all the variables represent positive real numbers. So this way we don't have to worry about absolute value or anything like that. So here in the very first example, although it came out kind of bad, uh, poor copy here, I have the square root of five times the square root of 13. Well, the square root of five times the square root of 13 is equal to the square root of 5 times 13. That's this product property here, this product rule for radicals. And if I multiply 5 times 13, I get 65. So this is equal to the square root of 65. And that's as far as I'm going to take this answer. Okay, doesn't really simplify. For part B here, I have the square root of 7 times the square root of 2xy. Well, very similarly, I'm going to use the uh, product rule for radicals. I'm going to write this as the square root of 7 times 2xy. And then I can simplify a little bit here by multiplying the 7 and the 2 together. And I get the square root of 14xy. So it doesn't matter if there's variables included. It works the same way. The next guy up is a cube root. By the way, on square roots, the index is 2. So they match, they match, even though the 2s aren't written in there. We talked about that before. I have the cube root of 4 times the cube root of 5. Well, because the indices are both 3, these are both cube roots, I can use the product rule for radicals, and I can write this as the cube root of 4 times 5, which is the cube root of 20. And there's my answer. For part D, I'm starting to run out of space here just a little bit. Let's see if I can keep this on, on the screen here. I have the fourth root of 5t, and I'm multiplying that times the fourth root of 6r to the third. Well, because they're both fourth roots, I can use my property here, my product property, uh, my product rule for radicals, and write this as the fourth root of 5t times. 6r to the third. Well, this is the fourth root. 5t times 6r to the third. I multiply the 5 and the 6, I get 30. And then t times r to the third is just that tr to the third, or I like to write them in alphabetical order with my variables. So I'm going to write it as 30r to the third t, the fourth root of 30r to the third t. Now, if you had the t here and the r to the third there, it's the same thing. Mul uh, multiplication is commutative. All right, for, uh, for part e here, this is probably the last one I'll be able to squeeze in. I have the seventh root. When's the last time you did a problem with an index of seven in your radical? Times the uh, 20x, excuse me, times the seventh root 
of 3x y to the third. Now, because again, they have the same index and because I'm multiplying here, by the way, this product rule for radicals works for products, doesn't work for when you're, uh, you have sums and differences. So in this case, this would be the seventh root of, using the property, all right, this is 20x times 3x y to the third. About this point, if you haven't already asked yourself, do I need to put this step in here or can I just go ahead and multiply them together? You can just go ahead and multiply them together. These aren't all that difficult to keep track of. And I have the seventh root. I'm just trying to emphasize it by putting this extra step in to show you the product rule for radicals right here. And this would be 60 x to the second y to the third. All right, and there we go. Now, the last one, I'm actually almost out of space here. I have a little space at the top of this next page here. This is the cube root. Let me write it down again here. This, this is part F here. This is the cube root of 5 times the fourth root of 9. Well, in this case, let's see if I can get this even up. There we go. In this case, uh, this is, you can't multiply these in this form because the uh, product rule for radicals doesn't apply. You have different indices. So in this case, cannot multiply. I'm just going to write down cannot multiply. Okay. Okay. Now we go from products in which we have this product rule for radicals to quotients and we have a quotient rule for radicals. Now the product rule for radicals and the quotient rule for radicals are really, really, really important if you're going to stick around in math for a while. They're important in algebra, they're important in pre-calculus, they're important in calculus. So you're going to want to try to remember these guys here. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and look at the quotient rule for radicals. Now the quotient rule for radicals is very similar to the quotient rule for products, except this is a quotient, not a product. It says if the nth root of a and the nth root of b are real numbers, and b is not equal to 0, and n is a natural number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or so on, then the nth root of a divided by b is equal to the nth root of a divided by the nth root of b or the nth root of the quotient is the quotient of the nth roots. And again, b can't be zero because you can't divide by zero. So this property is very similar in that you break, instead of a product into the factors, you break the quotient into the numerator and the denominator. You take the nth root of the quotient, it's the quotient of the nth roots, the nth root of the numerator divided by the nth root of the denominator. Now I'm gonna do some examples with this as well, but you uh, would be doing yourself a big favor if you take the time to Put this one in the old memory banks. Simplify. Assume that all variables represent positive real numbers. So for part A here, I have the square root of 100 over 81. Well, that's clearly the square root of a, of a quotient here. So I'm going to write this as the square root of 100 all over the square root of 81 using your quotient rule for, radic uh, for radicals that we just looked at. This guy right here. Okay. Well, this can be simplified because the square root of 100 is 10 and the square root of 81 is 9, so I get an answer of uh, 10 over 9. The next one up looks kind of like the same type of problem. It's just that in this case, when I break this into a quotient of radicals, the top radical, the square root of 25, or the square root of 11, does not come out to be. Uh, a whole number. Uh, it's an irrational number. So I'm going to leave it the same, but I'm going to take the square root of 25 and write 5 as my denominator. All right, the next guy up, part C here, is the cube root of 18 over 125. Now, again, using the property uh, right here, this would be the cube root of 18 all over the cube root of 125. And very much like the last problem, the, the uh, numerator does not simplify. Uh, 18 is not a perfect cube. So I'm going to leave that as the cube root of 18, but the denominator does simplify because 125 is a perfect cube. It's 5 times 5 times 5. So the cube root of 125 is 5. Next guy up. Um, let's put it right here. I have 
the square root of y to the 8 all over 16. Well, according to the quotient rule for radicals, this is equal to the square root of y to the 8 all over the square root of 16. Well, the denominator is extra easy. That's just 4 because 4 times 4 is 16. But in the numerator's case, uh, even though we have a, a variable there, uh, y to the 8 is a perfect square. y to the 8 is y to the 4th times y to the 4th. So I can just write this as y to the 4th like that. Now, some uh, students have a little trouble with that with the variable, but here's my rule of thumb. This looks like, a, this radical sign looks a little bit like it's a division symbol, like back in the old days in grade school when you wrote the division symbol. Okay? Since the index is 2, even though it's not written down, it's like I'm dividing the 2 into 8 goes in 4 times. That's how you're going to, uh, or at least an easy way to remember this. Okay, now the next guy up is the opposite of the cube root of x to the 2nd over r to the 12th. Well, don't lose your negative. This is the cube root of excuse me, the opposite of the cube root of x to the second, and then this is all over the cube root of r to the twelfth. Well, if I use the little shortcut that I was talking about before, looking at my index like it's the divisor, 3 doesn't divide into 2. So that part stays the same. So I'm going to write my negative sign. I'm going to leave the cube root of x squared up top. But down here, the 3 does go into 12 evenly four times. So I get an r to the fourth. See, r to the 12th is r to the 4th times r to the 4th times r to the 4th. And you would add the exponents. 4 plus 4 plus 4 is 12. That's why dividing by the index gives me that value. And here's my answer. Kind of messy. All right, the product and quotient rules for radicals are useful for simplifying radicals. Okay. Now, how do you simplify a radical? Well, you have to meet a certain number of conditions. And it's too bad... That good old Mr. Bartling doesn't still teach her because he created a song, which I do not know. I wonder if it's on YouTube. He created a song about how to remember how to simplify radicals. All that I have for you are um, the rules that I have written down or the conditions I have written down. So I'm going to go into those, but uh, we miss you, Mr. Bartling. Let's see. All right. Here are the conditions for a simplified radical. The radicand has no factor raised to a power greater than or equal to the index. Remember how I said 3 didn't go into 2 in the last example in the numerator? Okay. If the exponent or if the factor raised to a power has an exponent greater than or equal to that index, then it will simplify. You can divide it in. You also cannot have a fraction as the radicand. That's the part that's underneath the radical sign. So you can't have a square root or a cube root or a fourth root of a fraction and for it to be considered simplified. You also cannot have a denominator that contains a radical. So you can't have like a square root of 2 in the denominator. It's not considered simplified. And then on top of all that, exponents in the radicand and the index of the radical have to have a greatest common factor of 1. Now I'm going to kind of explain that one. That one's hard to just say but I'll be able to explain it a little bit more here uh, with some examples. All right. Now, if you, oh, let me keep that there. If you practice these a reasonable amount, keeping track of this, this becomes easier for you to remember. But if you don't practice it, or if you just go to some website, simplifyingradicals.com or something like that, and just have somebody else do it for you, you're going to have trouble. All right, so here we go. For part A, I have the square root of 72. Now, 72 is not a perfect square, okay? So I can't just come out with an answer like 7 or 8 or 9 or something like that. However, there is a factor. In fact, there's a, uh, a couple, three factors of 72, numbers that divide into 72 evenly, that are perfect squares. For example, 4 is a perfect square, and 4 goes into 72 18 times. 9 is a perfect square, 9 goes into 72 8 times. But my favorite is 36. 36 is a perfect square, and it divides into 72 2 times. So I am going to write this as the square root of 36 
times 2. Okay, because it's a square root, I'm looking for perfect squares. Now I'm going to use the, uh, the product rule for radicals. That, that was the very first one we had. And I'm going to write this as the square root of 36 times the square root of 2. Well, what does that do for me? Well, the square root of 36 comes out to be even. So I have a 6 here. The square root of 36 is 6 times the square root of 2. And that's as far as this is considered simplified. Okay, because the radicand 2 doesn't have any factors raised to a power greater than or equal to the index. The only numbers that divide into 2 are 1 and 2, and you don't really count 1. There's no fractions. There's no denominator with a radical. And there's really no exponents in here since this is 2 to the first power. And so that the index is a 2 here. 2 and 1 have a GCF of 1. Now, I look for these things. I mean, this is the fancy way of saying it, but I look for these things. I don't want any fractions on the radicals. I don't want any radical in the denominator. And I want to make sure that all the perfect, in this case, square, because it's square root, factors have been dealt with. And that was at 36, the largest one. So we'll try another one. Okay, let's see if we have any better luck here. This is the square root of 300. Now, I'm hoping you're looking at the square root of 300 and say, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a square root. There are some numbers that are factors of 300 that are perfect squares. Now, clearly, 300 is not a perfect square. But there are numbers that divide into 300, bigger than 1, that are perfect squares. For example, 4 is a perfect square, and 4 divides into it 75 times. 25 is a perfect square, and 25 divides into that 12 times. But my favorite, because it's the largest one I can think of, is 100. 100 goes into 300 three times. So I'm going to rewrite this as the square root of 100 times 3. Very much like I did the first example with the 36 and the 2. Finding the largest perfect square factor of the radicand. Then I'm using my product rule for radicals. I'm going to write this as the square root of 100 times the square root of 3. And the square root of 100 is 10 times the square root of 3. And that's as far as it goes. You pretty, you should be pretty confident that if your radicand, like in these first two, are prime numbers, it's as far as it's going to go. All right, now they are going to get a little bit more difficult. We're working our way towards those, but hopefully so far is so good. Part C here says the square root of 35. So this is a little bit like a problem like A or B in that all I have underneath it is a single number, 35. Now, is 35 a perfect square? No, it's not. 36 is, but not 35. Does 35 ha have any factors? Numbers that divide into 35 that are perfect squares greater than 1, like 4 or 9 or 16 or 25 and so on. And the answer there is also no. This one cannot be simplified. Cannot be simplified. I can write it all out. Okay. Now, they're not all like this, but we're working our way through some of these examples here. In this case, the square root of 35 is already in simplest radical form. The next guy up is a cube root. The cube root of 54. Now, cube roots are a little tougher because most people know they're perfect squares, but not everybody knows they're perfect cubes. And I'm going to work this problem like I did the first couple of them in that I'm looking for a factor of 54 that's a perfect cube. Now, perfect cubes means that they're a number that can be found by taking some other number times itself times itself again. Like, for example, the cube root of 125 is 5 because 5 times 5 times 5 is 125. Well, 54 is not a perfect cube, but it does contain a factor that's a perfect cube. And that factor is 27. 27 times 2 is 54, and 27 is 3 times 3 times 3, a perfect cube. Now, it's going to take you a while to get used to some of these other kinds of problems when you're dealing with cube roots or fourth roots or fifth roots. Because you have to know your perfect cubes, your perfect fourths, or your perfect fifths, perhaps. So now I can still use the product property, or the product rule for radicals, and write this as the cube root of 27 times the cube root of 2. And the cube root of 27, as I said before, was 3. So it's 3 times the cube root of 2, and that's as far as that one goes. Now we have one more here, but hopefully so far so good. All right, now part E is a little bit like part D. It is a, uh, it's got an index other than 2. This is a fourth root, and fourth root of 243. Now, 
If you didn't know your cube roots, you probably don't know your, uh, I should say your perfect cubes, you probably don't know your perfect fours. But, you know, by the time you get to perfect fours, it doesn't take a very big number to get up there to like 243 or somewhere in there. For example, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. Now, 16 doesn't divide in there uh, evenly, but it does divide in there less than 16 times. And then I think, okay, what else? Well, maybe it's 4 times 4 times 4 times 4. No, that's 256. That's too big. Well, are there any others? I did 2 and I did 4. What about 3? 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 is 81. Son of a gun. 81. <coughs> Excuse me. 81 times 3 is 243, and 81 is a perfect, oh, I wrote cube root, had 3 on my head, is a perfect fourth power, or fourth root. Well, let me try it again. I can take the fourth root of 81 because 81 is a perfect fourth power. So this is the fourth root of 81 times the fourth root of 3. And the fourth root of 81 is 3, so I have 3 times the fourth root of of three, that's this guy right here, and that's my answer. And as I mentioned, they're gonna get a little tougher. I haven't done anything with a fraction yet, and I haven't done anything with variables yet, but we're getting there. All right, so the more you practice these, the easier these are gonna be for you. All right, now let's look at some examples that have variables. Here I have the square root of 25p to the seventh. I have the square root of 72y to the third x. I have the cube root of negative 27 y to the seventh, x to the fifth, z to the sixth, and I have the opposite of the fourth root of 32a to the fifth, b to the seventh. All right, so now let's start here with a. I'm gonna write it down on this piece of paper and then I'm gonna bring it over here. This was the square root of 25p to the seventh. All right, the square root of 25p to the seventh there what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if there are any perfect squares, and there are. Okay, for example, 25 is a perfect square. Now, p to the seventh, because the exponent is greater than the index, that means that it has at least a factor that's, in this case, a perfect square. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this as the square root of 25 times the square root of p to the seventh. And then I'm going to write this as the square root of 25 times the square root of p to the sixth times p. The reason I'm writing it that way is because six is an even number, and that means p to the sixth is a perfect square. It's p to the third times p to the third. You just divide by two. So this becomes the square root of 25 times the square root of p to the sixth times the square root of p. Well, that's not so bad. This is five. This is p to the third power, and this is the square root of p. <coughs> and that's my final answer. Now, as you can see, if you read ahead, it says a shortcut for variables raised to a power is to divide the exponents by the index. However many times it divides, take that variable to that quotient power, and then leave the variable to the remainder power underneath the radical sign. So back here, my index is 2. If I divide 2 into 7, it goes 3 times. Notice the p to the third comes out. And it has a remainder of 1. And notice that the remainder is how many factors remain inside or underneath the radical sign. And that's the shortcut and how you want to do that. We'll try, we'll try another one here in just a second. Anyway, here it is written out for you again. All right, let's try part B here. We'll use the little trick if we can. I have a part B the uh, square root of 72 y to the third x. Well, I'm going to start with the uh, coefficient there of 72, and I'm thinking 72 is not a perfect square. doesn't have any factors that are perfect squares. As a matter of fact, it does. We did this one earlier. Remember, 72 is 36 times 2. So I'm going to write this as the square root. I'm going to keep it all under the radical for a second. 36 times 2, y to the third x. Now, this is equal to the square root of 36 times the square root of 2, y to the third x. And of course, that's 6. But we are not done. I'm doing this on purpose. We are not done because, as I mentioned, 
my index is 2 and I have a variable with a, an exponent that's greater than or equal to 2. So here's that little division trick that I was talking about before. I'm going to write this as 6, because I want to put the constant in front, and there's a 2 there. 2 goes into 3 one time. So I can bring out one factor of y, and I would have to leave, besides the 2, one factor of y, and of course the factor of x as well. 2 goes into 3 one time with one left over. That's where those come from. Takes a little bit to get used to that trick. Part C, even more. This is a cube root of negative 27, y to the 7th, x to the 5th, z to the 6th. Yikes. Well, this one's got some stuff to it. Okay. And again, we're assuming all the variables are positive real numbers, so we don't have to worry so much about somehow they become a, a negative. But we do have a negative under this radical. Now, you cannot take the square root or the fourth root or the sixth root of a negative number because there is no number times itself that's negative or times itself times itself times itself that's negative, an even number of times. However, this is an index of three, so you can have an odd indexed root that's negative because a negative times a negative times a negative, an odd number of times, is negative. And as it turns out, 27 is a perfect cube. Negative 27, even better. Negative, uh, because I did 27 before. Remember back here? I found that the cube root of 27 was 3. Well, the cube root of negative 27 is negative 3. So, I'm going to go ahead and write my radical sign down. I leave a little bit of space right there. Because now I'm going to tackle the variables. And I'm going to use the division trick. 3, now there's no number here because I it, the whole thing came out. It's like a 1. The 3 goes into 7 two times, so two factors out, with one left over. The 3 goes into the 5 one time, so I take out 1x, with two left over. And then the 3 goes into 6 evenly two times, so that z squared that comes out, no factors of z left over. I would probably take the step, just because I uh, like it a certain way, and put the, your uh, exponents kind of alphabetically, I'm going to write negative 3x, y squared, z squared, the cube root of x squared, y. And that's how I'd leave my answer. That one got messy in a hurry. You had to be very, very careful and then use the little number trick with the index. Part D. I have the opposite of the fourth root of 32, a to the fifth, b to the seventh. Well, as it turns out, 32 is not a perfect fourth power, but it does have an in, uh, excuse me, it does have a factor that is a perfect fourth. Because 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, four factors, is 16, <coughs> and 16 goes into 32 evenly. So I'm going to put the negative out in front here, and I'm going to write this as the fourth root, just to emphasize this, of 16 times 2, a to the fifth, b to the seventh. Now, the fourth root of 16 is 2, so now I have negative 2. And there's a 2 left over. Just remember, it's a fourth root. And now I'm going to do the little trick with the variables, the exponents, and the index. 4 goes into 5 one time, so I can bring out one factor of a with one left over, and I put in one factor of a left. 4 goes into the 7 here for the b to the 7th one time with 3 left over, so b to the third as a factor underneath the radical. Okay. And that's as far as that one simplifies. And I think that was all of them. They're just the four parts yet. All right, now, this is getting intense, especially when they start throwing in some variables and such. Now, before we get too crazy here, I want to go ahead and talk just a little bit about um, the, the rule. It was the, I think it was the fourth one of the conditions for simplifying radicals that we uh, showed a little bit ago, saying exponents in the radicand and in the index of the radical have to have a greatest common factor of 1. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to use rational exponents. Here's an example. If you notice here, the index is 9, the power is 6, they have a common factor of 3. So I'm going to write the ninth root as to the 1 ninth power so I have 5 to the 6 to the 1 9th power. Well, power to a power, you multiply the exponents, I get 6 over 9, because this is like 6 over 1 there. 
And then 6 over 9 reduces to 2 thirds. And this gives me, of course, there's the denominator, that's the index, the cube root of 5 to the second power, or the cube root of 25. And it gets a little tricky. I'll show you another one. The 6 root of t to the second power, the 6 and the 2 here, both have a common factor of 2. So I do the same little trick where I bring this as, since it's the index, as my denominator to the 1 sixth. So I have t to the second to the 1 sixth, which is t to the 2 sixth, power to a power, you multiply. And then I can divide top and bottom by 2 and reduce, and I have t to the 1 third, which is, as you may know, the cube root of t. And of course, um, I have, assuming t is greater than or equal to 0, uh, t is greater than, yeah, because originally it was an index here. And so we want to make sure that we keep our index here as a positive number. Yes, as a positive number. All right, or the, uh, the, the variable is a positive number, excuse me. The product and quotient rules for radicals work on radicals with the same in indices. What happens if they don't have the same indices? Well, then it gets a little bit trickier. Let's see if I have that page. Oh, there we go. I have the cube root of 3 times the cube root of 6. Well, when they have different indi indices, as we saw with one of the examples a while back, I said you could not multiply them. Well, I kind of, kind of fibbed a little bit. Here's what you can do. You can first rewrite these using rational exponents. So this is 3 to the 1 3rd times 6 to the 1 half. Now, 3 to the 1 3rd and 6 to the 1 half the denominators are different. I'm going to rewrite these so that they have the same denominator. So I'm going to write uh, denominator 6, so I'd have to multiply top and bottom by 2 here, top and bottom by 3. I get 3 to the 2 6 times uh, 6 to the 3 6. And the reason that I'm doing that is because now I can think of these each as um, a, uh, how do I want to put this? as 3 squared to the 1 6 power, and this would be 6 cubed to the 1 6 power. Well, 3 squared to the 1 6 power, that's the sixth root of 9. And 6 cubed to the 1 6 power, that's the sixth root of 6 times 6 times 6, 216. Well, now they have the same index, and now I can multiply them. This is the sixth root of, let's see, um, let's see, 1800, 1890, uh, 1944, I hope. The sixth root of 1944, uh, at least I think that's the answer. It's been a while since I've done that problem, but I'm pretty sure that's it. Okay. Now the next example is more of the same. This, I'm going to rewrite as 5 to the 1 half. This is 4 to the one third, my common denominator again is six. So this is five to the three six times four to the two six. Well, this is the sixth root of five cubed, and this is the sixth root of four squared. So this is the sixth root of five times five times five, which is 125, and this is the 6 root of uh, 4 times 4, so that's the 6 root of 16. And now I have to multiply 16 times 125 because now my indices match and I get the 6 root. Um, is that 2,000? I think it's 2,000. Now, there are lots of perfect 6, but I, don't, I can't think of a single one other than 1 that will divide into 2,000. So that's about as far as that guy is going to go. All right. We're going to uh, get to some stuff here with the Pythagorean Theorem. And then we'll look at the distance formula before we skedaddle from this section. All right, so let's go back to the Pythagorean Theorem. Now, in geometry, you studied this, and this was one of the most important theorems probably that you studied. Uh, and the Pythagorean Theorem was named after a Greek mathematician by the name of Pythagoras. And Pythagoras came up with the idea for right triangles only that if A and B are the lengths of the shorter sides or the legs of a right triangle and C is the length of the longest side, which is the, known as the hypotenuse, then A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And to my knowledge, there's well over 250 different ways that you can prove this to be true. 
I'm not worried about the proof, but I am worried a little bit here about as far as making sure that you understand with a right triangle, you have a right angle and two acute angles. All right, the hypotenuse is the side opposite the right angle, and the legs are the two sides that make up the right angle. Okay, the hypotenuse is the longest of the, the three sides. So in problem like A here, it says find x, it says find the length of the unknown side in each triangle. Well, x is the hypotenuse because it's opposite the right angle. And I know the two legs of five and eight. So I'm gonna plug this in for A, this in for B, and this in for C. For A squared plus B squared equals C squared, and I get five squared plus eight squared equals x squared. 5 squared is 25, 8 squared is 64 equals x squared. Add those together, I get 89 equals x squared. So x has to be the square root of 89. x can't be a negative number because it's the length of a side, so you don't have to worry about putting like a plus or minus. Now with that in mind, by the way, the little square symbol there represents that of a right angle. Here I've written down 90 degrees, so that's a right angle as well. And in part b, I know the hypotenuse. I know one of the legs. I don't know the other leg. So I'm going to plug this in for A. Here's B, and I'm gonna plug this in for C. Remember, A and B are the legs. So I have six squared plus B squared equals 12 squared. I have 36 plus B squared is equal to 144. I'm gonna subtract 36 from both sides in the attempt to solve for B, and this is 108. So B is equal to the square root of 108. Now don't grab a calculator to tell me that this is 10 point something or other. You can simplify this one though, because if, as I look at 108, I know that there are numbers that divide evenly into 108 that are perfect squares, bigger than one. And the number that, that leaps out into my mind actually is, uh, originally was four. And then I thought, no, nine goes into 108 12 times. But then I thought, no, no, no. This is 36 times three. So B is the square root of 36 times three, which would be the square root of 36 times the square root of three or six square roots of three. I hope that you can still see that. My paper got stuck there. And that's what B is equal to, that's what they want. They don't want a decimal, okay? Because if you get a decimal, then you're kind of defeating the idea of simplifying the radical. Now, the Pythagorean theorem is used to, de uh, to develop what we know as the distance formula. And I've got a little diagram here. I'm pretty sure you could probably find something in the textbook as well that's kind of like this. But if we have points P and Q, I just put them both in the first quadrant just to make it easy on myself. And point P is X1, Y1, and point, er, point Q is X2, Y2. I can find the distance between those two points by using the distances here to the perpendicular vertically and horizontally, they form a right angle. Because this point, call it point R, has the same X value as point Q, it has the same Y value as point B. And I can do the, the difference here between the Y's and the difference here between the X's for their lengths. So if I use leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared, and then I take the square root of both sides, you can see that I get the distance formula. Now you had this <coughs> as back far as probably your algebra one days, maybe even pre-algebra, but not everybody remembers it. Put this one to memory because it's a fairly important formula for to use. You can always use the uh, Pythagorean theorem to derive it, but this is good enough. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this formula here and we are going to find the distance between a pair of points. Now here's a pair of points <coughs> well, I've clearly talked too long on this video uh, that I'm going to use, and I'm going to plug this in. Now, it doesn't matter which one you call X1, Y1, and X2, Y2. I just want first one, second ones. Plug them into the formula. It's the difference in the X's squared plus the difference in the Y squared, the square root of all that. Got to memorize this, okay? So this simplifies 5 minus 2 is 3, 3 squared is 9. <coughs> 3 minus negative 1. It's positive four, positive four squared is 16. Nine, 16 is 25, so I have the square root of 25, the distance is five. Now I'm gonna do very much like this in, in this next example here, but I'm gonna do it from scratch. I'll call this x1, y1, 
and this x2, y2, and my distance would be, using the distance formula, the difference in the x's, so that's 0 minus a negative 3 squared, plus the difference in the y values, y sub 2 minus y sub 1, so that's negative 4 minus a negative 2, no, no, it's a positive 2, excuse me, a positive 2, and that gets squared. So I have the square root of, well, 0 minus a negative 3 is 3, so I have 3 squared. And negative 4 minus 2 is negative 6, so I have negative 6 squared. <coughs> 3 squared is 3 times 3, that's 9. Negative 6 squared is negative 6 times negative 6, it's positive 36. I get the square root of 45. And that's the distance between the two points, but stop. This simplifies. You don't want to leave your answer in a radical that's not in considered simplest radical form. Because the square root of 45, that's 9 times 5. So that's the square root of 9 times the square root of 5, or 3 square roots of 5. All right, and that's how this one simplifies down to. Now, if you're wondering, well, how come we didn't do any simplifying with fractions? They're all coming. It's just that we didn't get to them in this section. We're doing mostly with the products. So it's going to take a little bit to get used to. It's going to take a little bit of practice on your part so that you feel comfortable with this. As I always say, you must practice, practice, practice.